Murday. I slog into my bedroom, dragging my hooves, scuffing them on the plush carpet that the stately mansion of my employer had built for his wife and youngest fowl. Perpetrate the level of decency they were used to in Manhattan. Ponyville was quite a small town by comparisons. Not much for a spy or bodyguard to do most of the time. There have been a few instances where in which I needed to stand by my charge and protect her or teleport her to the safety vay as a gift Mr. Golden Spoon bestowed upon me. Mr. and Mrs. Spoon were tough enough to handle themselves. Yes, my duty was to protect their interests, but one in particular took prescience over them, over even their own lives, that in interest being the life of their daughter. Silva, Catherine Spoon, or Silva Spoon, as she had been known since her, uh, cutes in the era. I glanced back at the mark inscribed in the pony's form hides, a gold amber silver with a blue dagger set in the center, cocking sideways from the blade pointed towards my neck. Poof! What do Z see in Z things? I mused to myself. I closed the door with a kick of my rear hoof and let out a contented sigh. In here, I could be my handsome self. In the flash of green light flame, my gray coat, brown mane, and a tail vanished, leaving only a shiny black exoskeleton carpus with light, insect-like wings protruding through my blue pinstripe jacket. Gone was my straight-coiled unicorn form. In this, in its place stood one smooth out and slightly curved. Ah, much better. A sigh with relief, holding a form through burden less of my love reserves did take an effort. It's all magic and illusions. There are physical aspects and a changeling morphologic capabilities. My energy was low, but during our long trips I had fed off of Mr. Mrs. Golden Spoons several times in her private cabin on the airship. Still, I had tired of married as married sheet. I was just glad to be home, here in the confines of the Spoon family estate. I could relax and discard my weapons. Not much use for hoof guns, daggers, and kunai. In a town where the crime rate is so low that the biggest news was some lunatic burglar sneaking into the hospital to steal sloop slippers, or a book, or whatever. My days, as I said, not without ex some excitement. The day my Queen Dart rival returned and set Ponyville on his ears was the orders to grab young Sp Silver Spoon and teleport her to the safe, to a safe location. So I did so. I took the young filly in my foreleg and teleported her to the house of Zebra Witch Doctor. Deep inside the Everfree Forest, I figured. Hide in plain sight. What was the best option? Why would the creature cast his eyes on an area that was already problematic and full of chaos? Before that, there was a Paris Bright invasion, which I assumed were harmless pestilence, until they began eating parts of the mansion, leaving the food untouched. That I was not prepared for. I shot as many as I could, but it was no use. I've never needed a pyro more than that moment. But the fool would probably just burn down the entire estate. Maybe even the town. One shudders to think what goes on in the depraved mind of his. But after our failed invasion, her majesty couldn't pick and choose her warriors as easily. Then there was a Cerberus and the giant space bear sang 
but unfortunately neither comes to the estate or my young ward. Recently, though, I had, a, had only a fellow spy to contend with, a little cold, barely the weight of a feather, just skin and bones that left me to wonder how he lugged around the camera on his neck without hoppling on the over face first. I told him, in no uncertain terms, that I saw anything printed but myself and my young mistress, or her family's business, and the school rags of theirs. Then something bad might happen to him. After that, I extended a little professional courtesy and let him flit off on his way. He left the grounds after leaving a small puddle on our walkway. I took pleasure in the fact that he never bothered Miss Spoon or her parents any time soon, and that brought to mind just where my little mistress was tonight. Staying over at the brat's house, how I loathe that little trollop who laughingly prances over around like she was a, my queen. At least I knew Silver Spoon was physically safe, though I worry about the influence Diamond Tiara had on her. I shake my head in dis displeas. Though, Fox, it's not my problem. Why should I care if Silver's attitude with other fowls amounted to merit? I mean, isn't she isn't my nymph. Even if, right now, Diamond was feeding on my mistress, young mistress, as I would her mother and father. I may be straight, but I feed on any pony, griffin, diamond dog, or whatever it, if hungry enough. Miss Spoon sometimes goes for long periods of time without her husband, so the three of us have an unspoken agreement that if I am allowed to share her bed and his form in which to feed, so long as I do not pass myself off as Platinum Big Dipper Spoon without my mistress knowing before off. Silver Spoon is different. I do not pretend around her. She loves me for who I am. Just standing next to her gives me a taste of love that few of my kind have sampled. Her love. She loves me for me and not my construct. I create to draw out the love. One day, when she is of suitable breeding age, perhaps I shall feast on the love she has for me, since she was but a fowl in the manner in which I feed on her mother. I sigh with regret. She would never betray the little piglet she calls her special some pony. More is a pity. I let the hope of Drinking heavily on the elixirs of Silver Spoon's love die where it lies. I let the hope of drinking the heavil heavily on the elixir of Silver Spoon's love die where it is. I want for nothing in the way of love. My mistress and employer take good care of me re in the regards while paying for the fine suits and weapons. I don't have the holes that most of my kind possesses. I have a steady supply of love that keeps my limbs whole and my reserves full. I can teleport a great distance and remain invisible for an indefinite amount of time due to the fact that my changeling fire furnace is always stroke with the love of my mistress has for her husband, and on top of it, all I have, Silver Spoon's love. She has so much to give, but sometimes it's all bottled up, rationed, out of her parents, myself, and the pink monster she calls her filly friend, as if it were the last step of water in the middle of the desert. What more could a changeling ask for? I was once the only friend Silver Spoon had, back when she was still just a foul in Manhattan. Pathetic, possibly Sylvia, but she was known before she got her mark. Was the very isolated foul due to the nature of her, of her father's profession and reputation. Preschool 
was out of the questions, and even private schools did not offer the level of protections I could provide. Back then, the walking out of a broad daylight was a changeling brought an effective intimidation factor without alerting the authorities. Consequently, it also drove away parents who might otherwise have let Sylvia play with her f their fowls, but Big Dipper insisted his Little Dipper be escorted all at all times and be armed guards named Moyo. Before she come along, I had nothing but hatred for ponies, her older sister, Dementia Spoon, and I didn't get along. But then again, neither did her parents. When she got her cutie mark, she changed her name to Octavia Melody and left home as soon as she was 17 or 18. She's doing well in Canterlot. She was none too pleased when her family moved, only an hour trains a lot right away. I'd love to see the look face if she knew that her father had me run a furrow background check on her roommates of her. Vinyl something or other. As I loosen my tie, I think about how Little Dipper made me smile back when I was all she had. It was she that gave me my designated code name, Cypher. After watching a violent movie and wanting to curl up with me for the night, Nymph and my hives needed lots of love and attention. I figured a little earth fowl needed the same, though for entirely different reasons. Before I became a spy and assassin, I was just another drone and a drone's duty was to mate with the queen and provide for other nymphs. You wouldn't think so, but with me around, they had no need to hire a nanny using telekinesis. To change Little Silver Spoon's diaper was no terrible inconvenience. And the Little Pony Nymph bonded with me and I with her. I admit it was hard for me when she moved to Ponyville and started hanging out with the next door neighbor of hers. But I had to be glad. Just like any Nymph, she needed to get out with those of her own age. As far as I can tell, Diamond Tiara has rarely hurt Silver Spoon's feelings. Luckily for Diamond, she had no idea the pony hell I could rain down on her. Fat little head! I was tempted to do just that when the little married Bab Seed Orange went and betrayed my little mistress and pushed her into the mud. I was a severely tempted to call out associates in Manhattan and organize a little beatdown on the backstabbing little whelp. But I can't fight at all of Miss Spoon's battles for her. Besides, they seem to be keeping up a little pen pal correspondence since, and suddenly I remember of something important. I sit on my, down on my desk and hold my wings back, drawing out a quill and scroll. From the top drawers, I have put this off for too long. Dearest Queen Chrysalis, ruler of the southern hives, mother and provider of us all, forgive me for my regular report has been absent for a week or so at the least, not that there's much to report on. Ever since our failed invasions, I've been bored of out of my exoskeleton. I can't help but think. If you had only let me kill the Cadence in the first place, we might have been more successful. Forgive me once more. It seems so little happened in this Jerkwall water town that there's nothing better to do but reflect on the past and I end up restating matters that have long since lost their all merits or relevance. I make no excuse for my absence other and that of my current employers deciding to pack up and leave for Prans to handle some family business. Hopefully, you can appreciate what brings the mother to thousands. Being back there did have me reflect on the times the Spoon family sent me to train as a spy, where I got my charm and endearing 
accents that makes mares putty to my hooves. You'll be happy to know our business relationship with the Spoon family remains a well-kept secret from the Sun Tyrant and her dogs of war. I have kept a watchful eye on she who shall not be named, and her elements of associates have no idea as far as I can gather as to where my our new hives is, my queen. But perhaps we should be calling you the mother of the northern hive now. I have observed very little from the behavior of ponies as it relates to useful information, only that their so-called high society is not able, unlike the life of, our, of a changeling. They put on masks and act in a manner contradicting to their nature. They smile and wave and sneer and hiss behind the backs of their peers, and they run with whoever they like and pretend they are not animalistic as any other beasts of the field. They keep up their pretentious, not, gain, not to gain love as we do, but to gain prestige, wealth, and status. None more than our little, than my little mistress, one of the sweetest, most love-filled fillies you have ever met. And yet, I have witnessed her say the most awful things to her peers and laugh as she tears them down. And the most perplexing as to why I have not. I don't have one of those garish tattoos they call a cutie mark, and she never calls me a blank flank. As I have reported before, I believe hers to be a rare delicacy of love. She loves me for who I am and what I am. Why, she treats her fellow ponies like dirt and baffles. Must be her mob family mentality, established dominance. But then why let the daughter of a local retailer take the lead? I swear it doesn't matter how long I live among them. I will never understand these horses. As I said, there's not that much to speak of since the Gabby Gums incident that wasn't big enough to fill two whole paragraphs in my last report. My also pressing duties tomorrow includes escorting my young mistress to the home of the bearer of kindness to cure her pet raccoon. Why? Because her mother insisted that she doesn't want her fi filly within 500 f hooves of the Evertree Forest without an escort and Miss Goody Four Hooves lives right on the edge. Strange for a pegasus afraid of her own shadow to live within the Kunai's Froaba, the most wild and unpredictable area of Equestria. Once again, forgive me, my queen. I don't mean to bore you with my personal observations, but perhaps if we are not so different, there is hope for peace. Or, or perhaps it is the very thing that are similars between us that will forever separate us. Making open warfare an inevitable. This choice I leave up to you, O oh, wise and benevolent one. I continue to hone my skills and await your call of arms as much as I would hate to bring my her peaceful, peaceful world to an end. It will take solace in the fact that our centuries-old contract with the family will guarantee the protection of Silver Spoon should war no longer be avoidable. Your fur faithful servant, Spinedrone001, formerly of Her Regal Magistry Army Intelligence, codename Cypher. I sigh, thinking about escorting Silver Spoon to Miss Fluttershy's cottage tomorrow. I then roll up the scrolls in my hooves and concentrate the papers engulfed with a green flame of changeling fire and transformed into a white parasprite with green eyes. I send it flying out the window of my small second story bedroom. I hear a knock at the door and my weary grin cracks across my muzzle bearing off my fangs. Silver Spoon is spending the night with Diamond Tiara. Mr. Platinum Spoon is back in Manhattan overseeing some delicate matters on, of the Empire. 
There is only one pony. It could be Antrezo, viral Madam Spoon. My door opened, and in a step of tall grace, a snow white unicorn with a pale pink mane and tail. She is nude, wearing only a lavender eye shadows and matching her eyes. It is the first time I have seen her ill natural. Since we left Ponyville for France, ponies have tended to dress more heavily. Good evening, Miss Golden Spoon. To what do I owe the pleasure? I give her a worried grin, as if I don't know what she needs. I can smell her desire from here. As she turns to shut the door, I cannot but refrain from staring at her flank. For too long, her golden spoon cutie mark is covered and flanked, no pun intended, by two lavender fleur de lis that when, when all but the handles is covered by magic of her photo shoots. Because free fleur de lis, you'd be surprised how they keep her from being recognized as the famous supermodel Fleur de Lis. Good evening, Mr. Cypher. She smiles. I hope I am not intruding. I was feeling rather lonely. With what with my grandmother's passing. I can see where tears have stained her pure white cheeks. You were very close to Madame Lee, weren't you? She nods at the recollections of her departed grandmother. The concept of grandparents is very foreign to my kind. I state matter-factly, levitating a cigarette from my PDA case. Mind? I ask. No, not at all. Tis your room, is it not? One can barely discern her French accent. And she was born there, where I had only spent a few years in intense training. I levitate the lighter and draw in my breath, sighing as the miasma in my lungs. It's just that the little mister prefers I do not around her. She chuckles. At that, with her hoof, respectively, to her lips. A little pony is so afraid, the smell will be caught in her coat and not get it out. We both have a good laugh at her daughter's expense. Then our eyes meet, and we both smiling, smile knowingly. Just give me a minute to get changed. No need. She practically halts me in mid-transformations. Before I could don the guise of her husband. Pardon, eh, meo? I reply slightly in shock. Just this once? Just this once. She approaches me and places her hoof, stroking my tree cheek. Let me love you for who you are. I chuckle and snort at that. It puts her off slightly and makes her wink her cute nose. Madame, vows cannot make a pony love somebody if they hard did not willing to get along. But I appreciate the jester Moya Chiri. She is not determined by my revelations. Not everything has to be about love, you know. She explained with a coy and weary, seductive tone, as she uses telekinesis to untie my blue tie. Very well, milady. I reach into my magic pocket inside my suit and draw out my stock 357 Magnum with a pearl golden a pearl handle, holding it up to my hoof. She shivers and licks the length of the steel of the hoof gun. I feel it steering in my loins. It's not often that a mare is able to, to seduce me. I silently place my revolver on the desktop. I then put out my butterfly knife and flicker it, skillfully causing her to once again quake with desire. I know she is. She likes dangerous stallions. It makes me wonder why she went for the pompous Canterlot clown fancy pants in her. Those few short months of her, she had a falling out with her husband. The knife goes on the table. The inside pocket of my suit is a bottomless pit, tailored by the local mayor, with a true talent for the art of weaving magic into threads. Over the course of several minutes. 
I pull out one weapon after another, getting an exciting shiver and moan from her. Every knife and gun is a new element of foreplay for her. It's no wonder she married a gangsta. The piles of weapons grow on the desks as, all the while, she li is licking her lips, her arousal gro becoming more platable. She is right. Love is nothing to do with this. I draw, slowly, the external reward, the blade of cold, unforgivable steel shine in her lavender eyes. I could have sworn she just climaxed, but I'm not done yet. Oh, she moans as I bring out the big Pocona Arms Ambassador 50 Action Express. She shivers hard and her legs go get weak as I hold it for a moment and place it with care on the top pile. I reach out with my magic and roll out the left sleeve of my pocket of my bare foreleg, revealing the sharp dresser and detach the blade from my cuff, dropping it on the pile of knives, kunais, revolvers, and ammunition. That it? She smiles coyly. I lit out my left hoof, as if to say, one moment, before using my hoof to roll up my right sleeve, revealing a small enforcer, snub nose, 357 magnum revolver strapped to a holster on my right foreleg. I drew it out, and she grabbed it from me in an expert telekinesis. It's like disarming German A. She said, with a dangerous glint in her eyes. I chuckle nervously. It takes a strong mare to frighten me and excite me. I even jumped back slightly when I heard the gun go off, effectively shooting out one of the lamps I had burning. There was a flash of white-hot light, a sp some sparks, and the smell of ozone. As the room went dark, I could still make out her wicked smirk in the fading pink light of her own horn she tosses the small hoof gun still bathing in the aura of her magic then tackles me like a wild beast of tartarus i had teased the lioness through the cage bars and now that she was loose was going to tear me apart ah maun I'm more.